Westward expansion, the period from 1840 to 1849. Zoom it out just a little bit, just a little bit. The explosion westward. Now, guys, we had complicated worlds of the West. Most Americans held two views of the West, either as a desert where only the hardiest and most barbaric Indians could survive, or a resplendent Eden, rich in resources. Either way, there was lots of free land for the taking. And as our transportation system becomes stronger, speculators and settlers would follow. And even though we tried to implant our economic system and East Coast ways on the land, uh, the successful ones soon discovered that you had to adapt the land, not get it to adapt to you. Ready for the next line? Now guys, us going out there, it was an already incredibly complex world with the arrival of the Spanish, French, Russian, and other Europeans. Not to mention the myriad of Native American nations the intergroup uh, relations in the West becomes very, very complicated. Ready? Now, one of the first guys that went out West was William H. Ashley, who established the rendezvous system in the Rocky Mountains back in 1825. He worked for Astor Hats, and he wanted to make these hats out of beaver pelts because they were very popular. So what he'd do, um, he didn't want to use the old system of traveling to the different fur treppers, and instead devise a system where rugged mountain men like Kit Carson, Jeremiah Johnson, and the former slave, free black from Virginia, Jim Buckworth, as well as other unemployed men and Native Americans in the West, he basically set up a system where he said, okay, I'm gonna be in St. Louis uh, this time period. I'm gonna be here at Fort Atkinson on November 3rd, so I'll get all your furs and I'm gonna do all my trading here. Then I'm gonna go up to the Ankara villages to have all the great, so all the people that were uh, fur hunters could take their furs to a centralized market during a specific time and trade them for goods. And underneath this system, basically William H. Ashley made a lot of money. By his death, he was worth as much as Bill Gates in 1990. Ready for the next slide? Now, they had great successes, but then the fur trade kind of went down. Uh, I mean, a lot of be the beaver populations had been hunted out, but now people wanted silk hats from Asia, and so beaver hats were no longer really that fashionable. So a lot of the former fur trappers, they founded new communities, and the former organizers of the pelt trade 
became the general developers out in the West. And of course, you also had land speculators that contributed to the opening of the West. They bought land at low rates and then resold it in smaller parcels. So these were actually well-financed organizations. And if anybody has ever w watched those uh, flip it real estate shows, I think usually they're on on Saturday mornings. Uh, a lot of the guys that went out west, the farmers, they'd basically buy a plot of land, they'd improve it, maybe farm it one season, then put it up for sale. So they could head out farther west and make money off both the crops and improving the land. Now, of course, gold prospectors, they traveled even further west. And when they didn't find gold, they'd turn into permanent, uh, they'd turn into trying to build a permanent settlement. Ready for the next slide? Now, why were people heading out west? Well, guys, the same reason why people move today usually economic self-betterment. And especially when you had a lot of people uh, losing their economic and societal positions because of the rise of the factory system. And up in New England, you were having a shortage of land because basically people were buying up all the land or your father who had five sons, he had a hundred acres. Well, when he passes away, each son only gets 20 acres. And you can't really make a living out of 20 acres. So you'd have brothers selling out to other brothers. And also, up in New England, because they had textiles, you had a lot of people raising sheep. And the sheep ranchers would come and buy out the land so they could have wool for woolen clothes. Now, most of these migrants went out west in groups. For example, Ready for the next slide? You had small and mid-sized parties that went to land that was in a totally foreign country. First it was Spain under Moses Austin, but then by the time we get to Stephen F. Austin, it's Mexico. And people were leaving America to go to this new land. Why? Well, because, let me see. Basically, the land was only 12 and a half cents an acre. That is about one-tenth of what the land would have cost you in America. And not only that, but this was rich, virgin, fertile soil that had never been farmed before. Uh, Stephen F. Austin got to pick out where his land was going to be and he chose the title land between the uh, Brazos and Colorado rivers that was incredibly fertile. It had access to uh, the ocean so you could sell your cotton up in New Orleans or down in Mexico. It was perfect for agriculture. And Mexico was so desperate to try to get people here that they were allowing this Anglo-American immigration in. Because Texas had been radically depopulated. Now, if you're interested in watching, I put a documentary link 
uh, on your video files as well. And basically it talks about some of that. It's about a half hour documentary. Gonzalez, come and take it. About the first battle in the Texas Revolt. Ready to go to the next slide? Well, meanwhile, you also had large groups that were traveling from Missouri to Oregon, drawn by missionaries who had gone before them. And back in 1843, you had large-scale immigration uh, began, where the families would go out and settle near the missions. Meanwhile, the Mormons, well, remember I told you they had gone up to Illinois? Well, on June 27th, 1844, Joseph Smith was murdered by an angry mob. So Brigham Young uh, basically leads 1,600 Mormons out, establishes a base camp in Nauvoo, Iowa, and sends out an advance party of 146 searchers for a place to grow his church. Which, on July 24th, 1847, they choose the Great Salt Lake. Now guys, if you've ever been out to the Great Salt Lake, well now it's really nice because they've really done a lot of upgrades to the city. But that was a, a scrappy area to try to grow uh, your people in. Up, And I'll get back to why the Mormons were able to succeed. Now remember, many of these pioneers lack cash where they squatted on uh, public lands you know, who's going to be around to kick them out? And basically, Western congressmen secured passage of a pre-exemption bill that gave squatters the right to buy the public land they had settled on before it actually went to market. So in other words, if you're out there, you're growing some crops, you make a little money, all of a sudden, civilization finally comes out to you, uh, you've got the first dibs on buying that land. Ready to go to the next slide? The social fabric in the West. The cotton country. Now, of course, uh, in the South and Southwest, American Indians had prepared the way for American settlement by clearing the land for agriculture. The only deal is, in the South, you're gonna be doing cash crops. And differing land quality allowed for some settlers to really prosper while others didn't. So the Southwest quickly comes to replicate the South's hierarchical structure. You know, the planners at the top, everybody else down below. Ready to go to the next slide? Western Yankees. Well, just like in the South, uh, settlers in the former Northwest Territory found the way had been prepared for them. Native Americans had cleared the land for farming. Surveyors, though, laid out the land neatly into those townships. Oh, and by the way, Stephen F. Austin, down here in Texas, also surveyed his land uh, so that movement in would be much easier. Now, because you had the surveyors laying out the land, 
The Old Northwest was quickly replicated. Many of the features of New England, yet traditional institutions established, like this, they laid out in the grid work, this is where the church is going to be. This is where City Hall is going to be. This is where the stables are going to be, etc., so on. And unlike the Southwest and the cash crops, uh, in the Northwest, the soil was pretty much the same. And they were growing crops like corn, potatoes. Uh, so you see, it's much more egalitarian or equal because of its relatively uniform land quality and the crops that are being grown. Now, way out west in Oregon, conditions there were favorable for settlers. You had open, fertile prairies that provided good farmland, and relations with the Native Americans were at first quite good. Well, until the first Cayuse War, in 1847. But after that, they were peaceful again. And one thing that did bind all the regions together is that they all had religious revivals. They were a feature of life in the Northwest, the Southwest, and out West-West. And basically, in the old Northwest, in Oregon, they reinforced town life. Of course, we talked about in the Southwest and the West, what they're telling them to do is spread out even further. Ready to go to the next slide? All right, the Hispanic Southwest. Well, guys, remember, this was land that had been owned by Spain, and after the Mexican Revolution, it's owned by Mexico. Well, one of the really expensive things that Spain had kept up in order to attempt colonization was the mission system, just as they had done back in Spain to teach the, during the Reconquista, to teach the conquered people, hey, this is what the Spaniards do, this is our language, this is our uh, God, this is how we worship him, this is how we grow crops, etc. Well, after independence, they're privatized. So landmen basically go and buy some of these up. The Catholic Church does keep a lot. And at a lot of these places, you have interethnic and interracial harmony. You'll have Native Americans, Hispanics, Anglos get along pretty peacefully. Like in Northern California, you have this around John Sutter's settlement. In Santa Fe, uh, you had Native Americans, you had Spaniards, you had Hispanics, you had Anglos. Same thing in Texas, that all got along very peaceably. Well, in Texas, they got along peaceably till the Anglo-American uh, population got too big. Ready for the next slide? All right, the Mormon community. Conditions in Utah basically made a central management and control desirable. You had the Mormon church that was in charge of distributing the land according to the need and organized communal labor. For example, if you had a Mormon um, 
um, a man and a wife, they might get 10 acres of land, but a man who had several wives, he might get 40 acres of land. And if they had a few children, they might receive like 10 acres more. But the deal is the church expected the man who was given four times as much land to produce four times as much. And if he didn't produce four times as much, some of his land would be taken away and given to people that were more productive. And one of the reasons why the Mormons went to live out in Utah is because they believed nobody would want to live out in Utah. And they did everything they could to try to exclude non-Mormons. Indeed, during the 1970s, kind of as a PR, Stunt, the uh, Mormon church up in uh, Salt Lake City opened up some of their archives for the public. And when they opened up their archives, you found out things like the uh, Stony Creek Massacre, I think it was called, where like a party of 40 Missourians was going through Utah to try to get out to Oregon and Brigham Young heard about it and kind of got a hit squad together, sent out and killed all the people from Missouri. Oh, and by the way, guys, there is still a lot of bad blood. I didn't know this, but because uh, uh, I was just joking with a guy from Missouri that I met because uh, I was like, you know, talking about how there was a lot of bad blood back then. And all of a sudden, he just kind of, his back arches up and he goes, Oh, well, did they tell you about how those Mormons stole all our chickens? Did they tell you how those Mormons? And I was like, hey, hey, whoa, 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 calm down. And even though the Mormons did all they could to try to exclude non-Mormons, they built very close relations with the Native Americans. Now, why did they build close relations with the Native Americans? Well, if you remember, part of the Book of Mormon says that after Jesus, after there was the ascension in Jerusalem, that he came down over here to America and he preached the gospel to the Native American peoples here. So their relations were actually quite good. Ready for the next line? The triumph of manifest destiny. Okay, guys, uh, the rise of manifest destiny. As a concept, it contributed greatly to westward expansion. Basically, as an ideology, manifest destiny drew from religion as far back as Jonathan Winthrop who called uh, America a Zion in the wilderness a light to the world and basically it taught that American possession of all North America was God's design and that's what God wanted us to do For this reason, you had like Christian missionary organizations that supported expansion. Because going west would not only bring the gospel to the Native Americans, but eventually to uh, the Chinese and Japanese as well. Politicians, of course, follow suit. There's only one problem with us claiming uh, everything from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It's that little thing that there's other nations in the way. Oh yeah!
Ready to go to the next slide? Now, expansion in the north and west. It's interesting that the first place that we actually got into a little tension about this was uh, between the U.S. and Britain over territorial differences. I mean, up in the northeast, conflict flared over the U.S. border between Maine and Canada. I mean, <laughs> Maine was a state, maybe, and they didn't even have the boundary fully set out. And in 1838, a Canadian railway cut across northern Maine, building a railroad for a logging company, and another number of Canadian loggers moved into the area, and both New Brunswick and Maine call up their state guards and militias, and General Winfield Scott was called out to keep the peace until a truce was signed. And this truce basically prevented open war. Ready to go to the north? Next. Meanwhile, in the Northwest, y'all remember both England and America laid claim to Oregon? I mean, at the end of the War of 1812, Britain, Spain, Russia, and America all claimed Oregon. But by the 1820s, only the uh, U.S. and Britain continued their claim. And both us, both the U.S. and Britain, agreed to join occupation. And in 1827, we extended this agreement indefinitely with just one proviso. That if either the U.S. or Britain wanted to lay claim to the uh, territory, they had to give the other nation a year's heads up. Well, everything continued to go along well until in 1841, Ewan Young did something incredible for his country. He died. He died without a will. Now, guys, if you, and by the way, he was one of the wealthiest settlers out in Oregon, and he was America's westernmost settler. Well, if you die without leaving a will, who decides who gets your money? Well, the probate courts. And because Ewig Young was from New York, they followed the New York probate laws. Which is kind of saying, hey, American law is going to be followed here because it's going to be in American territory. Well, the American settlers, uh, they established a governmental structure in 1843, despite British objections. Settlers in the Willamette Valley began to make a call for a constitutional convention, and they passed the first Organic Act on July 5th, 1843, which made Oregon a republic in all but name. And they stated in their preamble that the laws would continue until such a time as the United States of America extended their jurisdiction over them. Oh, and by the way, guys, uh, just so you know, in the Willamette Valley, the people that were taking the vote, there was 102 people. There were 50 American settlers and 52 British settlers. Because they said, you know, we have to, in order to maintain our prosperity, we have to have some kind of government. They took a vote, and the vote was 52 were for America and 50 were for England. 
So two of the British guys voted for us. Ready to go to the next line? Well, then we got Texas. Now, remember, Mexico had its revolution. And basically, and it had most of the Southwest. And after they had their uh, revolution from Spain, basically Mexico City had a number of frontier revolts, like all the surrounding states in Mexico uh, had differing agreement as to how much uh, authority they wanted the federal government to have. Kind of like here in America, you know, states' rights, federal power rights. And so basically Mexico had to go around and put around revolt in the surrounding states. Now, by about 1832, there was a lot of tensions in Texas. Why? Because uh, Mexico, to encourage American settlement, um, we were a tax-free zone for seven years from 1826. So in 1831, that was supposed to be our last year of tax-exempt status. And Mexico had started to build a fort that was going to charge customs duties that would start in 1832 at Anahuac, which is just a little bit outside of where modern day Houston is. And anyway, a guy by the name of Juan Davis Bradburn that actually was an American, John Davis Bradburn, who had helped Mexico win the, her revolution from Spain he was put in charge of the fort. Well, William Barrett Travis, uh, he goes out, he's a lawyer, had just left his wife and son in Alabama. He started up practice out there, um, and uh, he basically was a prankster, and he got himself arrested. Well, the nearby settlers said, we've got to um, get free him, and we've got to get rid of Juan Davis Bradburn, because apparently he was, nobody was charging the same tariffs uh, along the uh, ports. There were only three of them here in uh, Tejas. So anyway, lead a rebellion against that. But we say that we did it for Mexico's brand new president, uh, Santa Ana. So we kind of got away with it. Well, then fast forward to uh, 1835. Uh, Travis tries to do the same thing in Anahuac, leading a revolt against it. Uh, this time, instead of receiving praise from his fellow townspeople, uh, he gets chided. And they were like, why the heck did you do that, man? Don't cause up trouble. He says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll write an apology in the newspaper. Well, guys, that apology never comes because less than two months later, uh, at Gonzales, uh, revolters had uh, where basically we rebel against the Mexican troops. Mexican troops go back into Bejar or San Antonio, uh, San Antonio de Bejar, um, and the uh, Texians surround uh, or attack Bejar, and um, it's about they lay siege to it for about a month, then attack it, and it's a house-to-house -house battle. Uh, but basically, they force the Mexican soldados to surrender. And the leader of the Mexican soldados was Martin Perfecto de Cos. And of course, you can just write down Cos. And we make him say that he can never come fight in, um, against Texans again. Now, guys, we were not fighting for independence. We were fighting for separate Mexican statehood from Salado. We were fighting to be an independent Mexican state. Well, there's only one problem with uh, Cos. Cos's brother-in-law was Antonio Lopez de Santana, was Santana. 
and there was no way he was going to let this rebellion against him stand. He brings his army up here before uh, anybody thought they could possibly be up here. And he surrounded Travis, Bowie, and 183 men at the Alamo. And as you can see, the flag that flew over the Alamo, that's the 1824 on the Mexican uh, flag, because basically we wanted Mexico to go back to the federal constitution of 1824 and separate Mexican statehood. Well, um, all of the 183 defenders that were there were massacred. Um, there were like 40 other Tejanos that had been there, but all the Tejanos had gone out to try to get more volunteers to come back. And the only group that actually did come to the Alamo after it was besieged was a group from Gonzales uh, that basically fought their way through enemy lines to get into the Alamo complex to basically die. Well, so we have 183 dead there. Then we have Goliad. There's a picture of Goliad right up there. Where um, 440 men, about, are massacred by the uh, Mexican troops. They surrender to the Mexican troops on um, Palm Sunday. They're all let out. The American troops think that they're going to be, you know, released back to go back to where they came from. But instead, the Mexican soldados shoot them in the back. Um, even though about three guys were able to escape. One guy who played like he was dead. Uh, one guy who ran as fast as he could. Uh, and he did take two bullet wounds before he fell in the creek that was next to Goliad. The Mexican soldados thought he was dead um, and left him for that. But then a Tejano came and he was nursed back to health. And so we have defeat and defeat. Meanwhile, uh, Sam Houston is in charge of the Texian army. And he's leading them further and further away from Mexico. And when the Mexican army stops for resupply at San Jacinto. Basically, that's when Sam Houston chooses to attack them. At four o'clock on April 21st, 1836, The Mexican soldados were caught totally by surprise. The battle itself only lasted 18 minutes. But basically, uh, by the next morning, there were 630 Mexican soldiers killed, but only nine Texas soldiers who were killed. Oh, and by the way, Juan Seguin, who was a Tejano, um, who uh, helped, uh, was the first mayor of San Antonio underneath Texas as a republic. Uh, he was at the battle and he was, he and a lot of the squad were watching the twin sisters, which were two little cannons that Texas had. And basically we get uh, Santa Ana to sign the Treaty of Velasco where he says that he would work for Mexican recognition of Texas independence and basically he said that the southern boundary of Texas would be the river that they crossed to re-garrison and guys Historically, since its founding, this has been the boundary of Texas, right there, okay? And so for Santa Ana, the river to regarrison would be the Nueces River. However, the only problem is there are no Mexican garrisons between the Nueces River 
and the Rio Grande River. But on the Rio Grande River, there are garrisons. So because this was the river that they crossed to re-garrison their troops, Texas goes, ah, that means we have all this land all the way down to the Rio Grande River. And of course, we go to America and we say, America, take us, baby. Who loves you? And America, much to our surprise, says, uh, no. Ready for the next slide? Now, President Tyler, I know a lot of you are always saying, hey, Galloway, we, our last president was Harrison. Well, Harrison was an old guy. And he wanted to show kind of what a manly man he was, so he didn't wear a coat in the walk from inaugural hall to the White House. Because of that, he catches pneumonia and he dies. So that's where we get President Tyler, who was the vice president, who really starts to get involved in the politics of Manifest Destiny. For example, he signed the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which settled the border between Maine and Canada, and the United States got more than half. I mean, that, what we wanted was in that kind of whatever color this is, but what we got was even more. Tyler asserted the U.S. claim to Oregon by appointing a federal Indian agent to go out there. And his administration negotiated a treaty to annex Texas, which the Senate declined to ratify. Why? Because of the slavery issue. They didn't want another slave state admitted. Ready for the next slide? Well, basically, expansion was the major issue in the presidential campaign of 1844. Henry Clay, that guy who had done the Missouri Compromise, the guy who had always wanted to be president, um, he was the Whigs candidate. And he was opposed to the immediate annexation of Texas over reasons of uncontrolled expansion of slavery. Well, what about the Democratic candidates? Well, it was between Polk and Martin Van Buren. And Van Buren was also a guy that was against the annexation of Texas because of the uncontrolled extension of slavery. So if he had won the nomination, Texas may have remained an independent republic, but uh, Polk won. He got the nomination. Oh, and by the way, guys, uh, just so you know, uh, Polk's vice president was George Dallas, and he may be who Dallas was named after. We have no idea. You ready? Well, basically, um, the Democrats called for the immediate annexation of Texas and the acquisition of all of Oregon to 5440. Indeed, they said 5440 or fight. Well, in the dying days of Tyler's presidency, 
Congress approved a joint resolution annexing Texas right before Tyler left office. Now, because Texas is the only state that got annexed that way, Texas gets to keep all of its land. In other words, Texas owns 100% of Texas. If the federal government wants to like build a military base, they have to buy that land or rent that land from us. That also means we own all the oil below that land. Also, Texas is the only state that has a right to fly its flag at the same height as any other country because we were a country that had been recognized by at least seven other nations. The one thing, we do have other little things, but I will tell you this, the one thing we cannot do is cede from the rest of the United States. Sorry, we, we can't do that. That whole Civil War thing, that kind of made sure that wouldn't happen again. Anyway, so now basically uh, they're going to focus on Oregon. And because we had that 5440 or fight, basically Hudson's Bay Company, which was the British company that was in control of the fur trade, they sent all their fur trappers into that area to kind of hunt out the population of fur-bearing animals. You know, they moved them from the Great Lakes over to this area, which is kind of like eco-terrorism. But it also was a good thing for the Hudson's Bay Company because that allowed their fur-bearing populations near the Great Lakes to replenish their numbers And when the hunters arrived back at the Great Lakes, basically they were much more scientific uh, in in hunting for uh, fur-bearing animals and would only kill so much. It's called culling the herd, which led to healthier populations of fur-bearing animals. And at the end, despite all the sword waving, they decided on the uh, 49th parallel where it is today. Ready for the next slide? Expansion and sectional crisis or conflict. The Texas Crisis and Sectional Conflict. Okay, so the U.S. annexes Texas. And Texas says our border is the Rio Grande River. And Mexico says no, it's the Nueces. That's where Corpus Christi is, at the mouth of the Nueces. So they come down here, they land troops at Corpus Christi, and they march uh, down through the disputed territory to the mouth of the Rio Grande. There they build a fort, uh, name it after the commander of the garrison, or no, they named it Fort Texas, and the commander of the garrison was uh, uh, Commander Brown. Well, that night there's a cannonade, uh, Brown dies, so they name it Fort Brown, which grows into Brownsville. Next day we send out army units to search for the Mexican army, They've, the Mexican army has also sent out units at this little place that now is in a, a mall parking lot next to a Rasaka, which is a dry riverbed of uh, the rivers that fed into the Rio Grande. Mexico meets America. Shots are fired. Americans die. Mexicans die. Both sides rush back to... Um, their forts. And now the American newspapers can say American blood has been shed on American soil as the swords start to rattle for war with Mexico.
Now you ready to go to the next slide? Now, does everybody for war? No. The Texas crisis and sectional conflict continued. Many in the U.S. were opposed to the war. Uh, this concern arose between expansion and slavery. I mean, this is when we get Thoreau's civil disobedience. Now, as you can guess, this issue really put the slavery issue, that thing that the U.S. government didn't talk about, but now it can't be avoided. I mean, for the South, they saw great, that they'd have an expansion of their economic and congressional power. The North really freaks out, and they see this whole slave power conspiracy now, once again, even though slavery is becoming more of a moral issue, what the northern farmers were afraid of, they were afraid that basically planters were going to move north and start making plantations, but growing white corn. Guys, you cannot effectively have a plantation growing corn. But the north was frightened that something like that would happen. You even had appropriations for the war effort being held up by a debate over the proposed Wilmot Proviso. This was a proposition to a bill for war money that said that we're only going to give money to fight this war if slavery would not exist in any of the territories taken during the war. And it was turned down as unconstitutional. Ready to go to the next slide? Okay, the war with Mexico. In California, the American settlers revolted against Mexico, establishing the Bear Flag Republic that lasted for about a week. Polk, meanwhile, sends an army to uh, Santa Fe. which secured the entire region without opposition. And in Mexico, meanwhile, they're defeated on several fronts. You have Taylor over here in Texas. Now, what was one of the pivotal things to Taylor's success? Well, he had a group of regular irregulars. Ready for the next slide? The Texas Rangers. These guys used to be the army of a foreign nation, Texas. They didn't really wear uniforms. They provided their own horses. They provided their own weapons, which seemed to be they had everywhere. Knives, pistols, swords. They basically uh, knew how to fight uh, wars down here. And indeed, when the army was out at Buena Vista, there was a group of about 15 rangers that were scouting to see where the Mexican army was. All of a sudden, they see Santa Ana and his army, and they were not expecting Santa Ana to be that close. And of course, they're kind of going through a mountain pass. So 10 of the rangers stay at that pass. They send back the other five to alert Taylor. And the 10 that are there holding off that mountain pass, um, they're all killed. And one of the guys who was killed was um, Walker, Texas Ranger, Sam Walker, a guy who helped perfect the uh, Colt six-shooter. 
But the five guys were able to get back to Taylor, warn him he was able to set up his troops just in the nick of time. And Santana and him, uh, basically they fought each other to a stalemate. But early the next morning, all of a sudden Santana's troops leave the field of battle. And so it's called an American victory. Well, why did Santana's troops leave the battlefield? Well, because basically Scott, <coughs> excuse me, had uh, been bomb. He basically laid a siege to Veracruz, and he bombarded it. killing almost a hundred uh, civilians. He lands his troops. They begin their march over land to Mexico City. And of course, that's why Santana had to retreat to there. But uh, he was able to seize Mexico City. So he's taken over the capital of a foreign country. And that's where the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed. The war with Mexico continued. And basically at this treaty, we take uh, more we take up almost half of Mexico's territory. We set Texas's border at the Rio Grande River. We get all of New Mexico, we get California. We say that all the people in the captured territories are now US citizens. And all of the titles and rights that they had under Mexico, they now also enjoy underneath uh, America. And curiously, the U.S. pays $15 million to Mexico. Now that seems real curious, but one of the things I didn't tell you was that when America, we did have some negotiations with Mexico. We sent an ambassador down there, Ambassador Poinsett, who brought back a plant that now you call Poinsettas. Anyway, he, he tried to get Rio Grande as a border with Texas and we'd pay Mexico 15 million dollars just for the border at the Rio Grande. Mexico said no, we go into a war, we take all this land and then at the end we go ahead and we give them the 15 million dollars. Okay guys, uh, we have basically two lectures left. Um, I think, yeah, uh, tear in the seams and um, the Civil War. All right, so be looking forward to them.